Hello, everyone. I'm Kamran. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors. Today, we will be discussing Book 2, Chapter 7 of Dead House Gates, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is part one of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it's most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading these books. Know that Cameron and I know that this series is the best fantasy series ever written, and we're approaching this from a purely fanboy point of view. And that we will be providing no literary critique, at least not about this series. Just pure love, baby. We will be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that have not read the books. We will try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. Now, quick warning, today's episode contains scenes of violence, so today's episode is not recommended for children. Our show is listener-supported. If you would like to support us, we would really appreciate it. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we are posting ad-free episodes on Patreon weekly. Also, we would really like to hear from you, so send any feedback or comments to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. All right, Chapter 7, Part 1. We are taken to Duiker on the plains south of Hisar. His vision was filled with the scattered remains of burning wagons, the bodies of horses, oxen, mules, men, women, and children, pieces of furniture, clothing, and other household items. Here and there, mounds of bodies rose where warriors had made a last desperate stand. It appeared that no prisoners were taken. The renegade sergeant stood a few paces in front of Duiker as he took in the scene of the battle that would become known for the village less than a league distant, Batral. Duiker leaned in his saddle and spat. In a sour tone, he said, the wounded beast had fangs. He thought, oh, well done, Coltane. They'll hesitate long before closing with you again. Even his sorry children had been flung into the fighting. Mm. You know, this makes me think about other parts of the world where they don't have the luxury of having a minimum age for their military when a war is going on. Oh, yeah. yeah I have images in my brain right now, just when you say this, of African children with AKs in their hands. It's a very sad state of affairs in other countries. Yeah. I know during the Iran-Iraq war, the Iranians, they were bringing children in on their side. Wow. It's pretty serious. That's serious stuff, dude. Black scorched scars crossed the battlefield as if a god's claws had swept down to join the slaughter. Pieces of burned meat clogged the scars. Cape moths fluttered over the scene. The air stank of sorcery. The clash of warrens had spread greasy ash over everything. Somewhere to the southwest was the seventh remnants of loyal Hisari auxiliaries and the Wiccans, and tens of thousands of Malazan refugees. The peril remained. Already the army of the apocalypse had begun regrouping in the Myla oasis, where awaited the Sialk reinforcements and late-coming desert tribes. When they renewed the pursuit, they would still vastly outnumber Coltane's army. One of the sergeant's men announced, Chemist Rello lives. Another high mage brings a new army from the north. There will be no mistakes next time. The sergeant said, We join the others at Myla then. Duerker growled, Not I. The rebel's eyes narrowed on him. Duerker continued, Not yet. My heart tells me I shall find the body of my nephew out there. One soldier said, Seek first among the survivors. Duerker said, No. My heart does not feel fear, only certainty. Go on. I shall join you before dusk. Duerker swung a hard, challenging glaze to the sergeant and said, Go. The sergeant gestured. As Duerker watched them walk away, he thought if he saw them again, it would be from the ranks of the Malazan army, and somehow they would be less than human then. The game the mind must play to unleash destruction. He'd stood amidst the ranks more than once, sensing the soldiers alongside him seeking and finding that place in the mind, cold and silent the place where husbands, fathers, wives, and mothers became killers. And practice made it easier each time until it became a place you never leave. And that's some pretty dark stuff there. Would you call that a form of PTSD? I'm not sure if that would be PTSD or just another uh, safety net our brain might help to, you know, because I, I, again, I can never imagine what it's like to be in a combat, and especially in this type of combat where it's sword swinging. <laughs> face to face you know you're right on each other you can feel each other's breath and you're swinging swords at each other that's uh so i don't know if it like i said if, if some kind of mental survival mechanism to keep you intact and sane so you don't get the ptsd yeah i mean dehumanizing people 
just for your own mental safety. Like mm-hmm. I understand why people have to do it, but I, I can't think of another way of processing that as some type of trauma, you know, like a, yeah. it, I, I think it, it, it must fall within that. It probably does. How do you turn that off? That's the thing. I don't think that you do. That's what it, I think that's when it becomes like, this is probably the seeds of PTSD. <laughs> if he survived, yeah, cause I was campaign, thinking of things like deer hunter, yeah, yeah. yeah so golly, even so dark. Yeah, other movies get, where they I come get, back. I get depressed even – yes, just hearing the name of that movie, it's like that's the heaviest, most depressing movie I've ever seen in my life, I think. It's like, oh, it is so harsh. Whew. Mm-hmm. But I think this is kind of where the seeds of that PTSD slash shell shock or whatever probably that starts to develop is in that where you start learning to dehumanize people probably. That's a good call. Shell shock's a little bit different, right? Because that's yeah. like sensory overload. That is this true. is how you process killing other humans, justifying it in your mind to make it okay. Right. Because otherwise you're just looking at them like, this is some other guy. He's got a family just like me. He doesn't want to be there any more than I want to be here. Yeah. But we have to do what we have to do. And I'm assuming the soldier on the other side does the same thing. We know they do because they look, they, they already hate them. They especially hate the Malazan. So. They have no problem, but for them, it's coming. <laughs> They've learned this. Mm, yeah, it, there's a sense of retribution, I guess. But uh, no, I take it back. I don't think you can say that about every soldier in the army. There's no, going to be no. people that take advantage of it. Yes. And then there's going to be the people that are like, I just want to live my life. They're in a fishing village somewhere, or they're a farmer, and they just want to be able to grow their crops and provide for their family. Yeah. They're getting caught up in this stuff, don't have yeah, a choice. Get caught up in a war. <laughs> yeah. Damn gum it. <laughs> Duerker rode out into the battlefield, almost desperate to rejoin the army. There were no looters, not but flies, cape moths, risen, and wasps with their wings fanning and buzzing in the air around him as he rode onward. Half a mile ahead, Duerker reached the low ridge. Before him, the dusty ground was rutted and churned. The column that had departed the battle site had done so in an orderly fashion, though its width suggested that the train was huge. Nine, ten wagons abreast. He thought, Queen of Dreams, how can Coltane hope to defend all this? Two score thousand refugees, perhaps more, all demanding a wall of soldiers protecting their precious selves. Even Dasim Ultor Ultor. would have balked at this. (laughs) That would be such a formidable task. The logistics of this whole thing boggle the mind. You know... The thing I'm trying to do here is to remember how I felt the first time I read this. Because just that fact alone, just I sat around, I think, with my mouth open for a while, just at the thought of this guy leading 40,000 refugees, (laughs) roughly, just out in the midst of this hostile land and hostile people. I mean, wow, that's, uh, that's an overwhelming fact. And I still have that same reverence, but it's more like, because we know what's coming. <laughs> yeah, it's even more reverence for me now. I, I, I guess it's what it is. Yeah, it's more because you're like, oh, man, here we go. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I fully realize the scale of it. But as I'm thinking about it now, I think about all the factors that are at play here. They're on yeah. a arid continent that yes. doesn't have water. These people are on foot. And they're talking about having to transport them hundreds of leagues while being harried by horse warriors the whole time. The whole time. The whole yeah, time. it's just unimaginable. <laughs> you know, it's like the, what's that? Is it 16 blocks? Is that the one where Bruce Willis has got to get somebody to get in the prisoner transport or something like that? It's, it's, a, it's a remake of Clint Eastwood's Gauntlet, where he just has to run the gauntlet, trying to, they're running the gauntlet the entire way. Once they start running and are, are trying, it's not necessarily running, it's orderly, but it, let's call it what it is. It is a retreat, so we're running. Is it like the Warriors? Kind of. I, I, I don't re- – I say this. I can't remember the Warriors enough. It's it's what happens – Well, they were in enemy 16... territory being yeah, attacked by gangs and stuff, right? I guess it's I guess it's real similar because you have a guy that's having to sneak through buildings because the streets have been blocked off by the police and they've just turned it to a shooting match trying to kill this guy that you're trying to transport. Mm. Everyone's trying to kill you. Everyone is trying to kill you. So it's kind of like that, and that's how I feel about this. It's like except you got Coltane and this refugees – out of the desert with all that going on the whole time. Yeah, the difference is in that context, it'd be like trying to transport 200 people through those buildings yeah, with yeah. one guy defending Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right? what it is. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. 
<laughs> yeah, Bruce Willis. Colin Bruce Collins. Willis is the man for that, though. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> he was the man for that. Sorry, I haven't seen that movie actually. It's not great. It's just one of those. It's fun. It's entertaining. It's fun. Okay. Far to the east, the sky above Sialk indicated it was aflame. There had only been a small marine garrison in that city. With Opon's luck, they'd made good their withdrawal, though Duiker held little hope in that. It was simple enough to follow the trail Coltane's army and the refugees had made, southwestward, inland, into the Sialk Odon. With Camist Rello's apocalypse in pursuit, Duiker knew he might rejoin the army only to die with them. Nevertheless, the rebellion might well have been crushed elsewhere. There was a fist in Karan Tepasi, another in Guran. If either or both had succeeded in extinguishing the uprising in their cities, then a feasible destination was available to Coltane. The journey across the Odon, however, would take months with few sources of water. And the dry season had just begun. Duiker thought, to contemplate such a journey is beyond desperation. It is madness. That left counterattack, a swift, deadly thrust retaking Hisar, or Sialk. A destroyed city offered more opportunity for defense than did Steppe land. The Malazan fleet could then relieve them. Hormqual might be a fool, but Admiral Nock is anything but. The Seventh Army could not be simply abandoned, for without it, any hope of quickly ending the rebellion was lost. It was clear that Coltane was leading his column to Dryge Spring, and Duiker expected to rejoin him well before then. The foremost need for the Malazans now was water. Chemist Rello would know this as well. Duiker rode on. The occasional body of a refugee or soldier who had died of wounds lay on the trackside, dumped without ceremony. Leaving such unburied bodies in their wake would have been a difficult thing to do. Duiker sensed something of the desperation in that beleaguered force. And I imagine that would be really hard. We've spoken about the bonds of brotherhood in the military. To leave a brother or sister's body like that without the opportunity to have some closure would be really difficult. Yeah, I know. I can't hardly imagine what that would be like to especially have to leave a fallen comrade in the dirt where they fell. It would definitely weigh on you. An hour before dusk, a dust cloud appeared a half league inland. Tithen horse warriors, Duiker guessed, riding hard toward dry spring. There would be no peace for Coltane and his people. Lightning raids on horseback would harry the encampment's pickets, sudden drives to peel away livestock, flaming arrows sent into the refugee wagons, a night of unceasing terror. Duiker watched the Tithanzi slowly pull ahead and contemplated forcing his weary mount into a canter. He would have to kill his horse in the effort to reach Coltane before them, and then he could do naught but warn of the inevitable. Besides, Coltane must know what's coming. He knows because he once rode as a renegade chieftain, once harried a retreating imperial army across the Wiccan plains. I bet that original campaign would be a really good story. I agree to that. I, I think Coltane needs to have the same respect for his name as we have for, dare I say it, Dasimultor. <laughs> okay, so my obsession with Dasimultor right now, what I'll say is that's one of those names. Yeah. that i would name one of my kids i get it it's so it's like, <laughs> like so, i feel like there macho. was a missed opportunity here <laughs> because i committed to naming my kids after some characters in dune before they were born so i was like i'm gonna name them this 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 and this oh, i will crazy. say fortunately i didn't have a fourth son because i don't think i could have got it past my wife to name him omnius <laughs> 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 I got the three, <laughs> so yeah, I'm good I'm, with I'm, that. So I'm, I'm really, I'm really proud of the of the fact that you got three, bro. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm really impressed with that. Yeah, it it took some bargaining. I will say. <laughs> oh. Duerker continued on at a steady trot, thinking about the challenge of the night ahead. The ride through the enemy lines, the unheralded approach to the seventh's nerve frayed pickets. The more he thought on it, the less likely seemed his chances of surviving to see the dawn. The red sky darkened with that desert suddenness. Moments before he lost the last of the light, Duiker chanced a glance behind him. He saw a grainy cloud visibly expanding as it swept southward. It seemed to glitter with a hundred thousand pale reflections. 
Cape moths, surely in their millions, leaving Hisar behind, flying to the scent of blood. He told himself that it was a mindless hunger that drove them. Hood, after all, had no need to manifest his presence, nor was he known as a melodramatic god. The Lord of Death was reputed to be, if anything, ironically modest. Duerker kicked his horse into a canter, eyes fixed once more on the growing darkness ahead. We are taken to Felicin, Heberich, and Baden. From the crest of the low rise, Felicin watched beetles as large as Baden's thumb seethe on the floor of the basin ahead. Heberich, ever the scholar, had gone off to determine their destination. Twenty minutes had passed since then. Baden crouched beside her. She sensed his growing unease, but had decided that she would not be the one to give voice to their shared concern. There were times when she wondered at Hebrick's grasp of what mattered over what didn't. She wondered if Hebrick was, in fact, a liability. The swelling from the blood fly attack had ebbed, enough so that she could see and hear, but a deeper pain remained. There was a poison lodged within her. Her sleep was filled with visions of blood, unceasing, a crimson river that carried her like flotsam from sunrise to sunset. Six days since their escape from Skull Cup, and a part of her looked forward to the next sleep. Originally, I thought this dream was about her desire for vengeance. We'll get a little bit more insight into why she looks forward to it later in this chapter. Okay. Bodden grunted. Hebrick reappeared, jogging steadily. Squat, hunched, he was like an ogre shambling out from a child's bedtime story. Tales to frighten children. Felicin thought, I could write those. I need no imagination, only what I see all around me. Heberick, my boar tattooed ogre. Bodden, red scarred where one ear used to be, the hair growing tangled and bestial from that puckered skin. A pair to strike terror, these two. Heberick reached them and mumbled, extraordinary. Bodden grunted again. But can we get around them? I ain't wading through, Hebrick. Hebrick said, oh, I, easily enough. They're just migrating to the next basin. Felicin snorted. And you find that extraordinary? Hebrick said, I do. Tomorrow night, they'll march to the next patch of deep sand. Understand? Like us, they're heading west. And like us, they'll reach the sea. Bodden asked, and then swim? Hebrick said, I have no idea. More likely, they'll turn around and march east to the other coast. Bodden strapped on his pack and stood. He said, like a bug crawling the rim of a goblet. Felicin glanced at Bodden and remembered her last evening with Beneth. Beneth had sat at his table in Beulah's and watched flies circle the rim of his mug. It was one of the few memories that she could conjure up. She thought, Beneth, my lover, the fly king circling skull cup. Bodden left him to rot. That's why he won't meet my eye. Thugs never lie well. He'll pay for that one day. Every time I hear someone will pay for something, it reminds me of when my youngest whispered, you will pay for that. And then he scratched one of his siblings' faces, causing them to scream. You remember I told you that story? Yes, you did. I'm sorry. This still, this still makes me laugh. The fact that one of your children has, in fact, said you will pay for that. Is priceless and, and horrifying at the same time, and followed through with it is also kind of scary. But I really appreciate the follow through. <laughs> what you need to do: show this kid the matador or the mechanic, and you might have a future professional there. But uh, you, can oh, show man. Him Leon, you can show him Leon the professional if you want to show him a really great movie. Oh, but, it's gonna be a, a couple of years before I show him that movie. <laughs> oh, you will pay. <laughs> Hebrick said, "Follow me," and set off. His feet sank into the sand so that it seemed he walked on stumps to match those at the end of his arms. He always started out fresh, displaying an energy that struck Felicin as deliberate, as if he sought to refute that he was old and the weakest among them. The last third of the night, he would be seven or eight hundred paces behind them, weaving with the weight of the pack that nearly dwarfed him. Bodden seemed to have a map in his head. Their source of information had been precise and accurate. Even though the desert seemed lifeless, water could be found. Spring-fed pools in rock outcroppings, sinks of mud surrounded by the tracks of animals they never saw, where one could dig down an arm span, sometimes less, and find water. They had enough food for twelve days, two more than was necessary for the journey to the coast. It was not a large margin, but it would have to suffice. For all that, however, they were weakening. Each night they managed less distance. 
months as Skull Cup had diminished some essential reserves within them. Time now stalked them, Hood's most patient servant, and with each night they fell back farther, closer to that place where the will to live surrendered to a profound peace. Hebrick asked, Your thoughts, lass? She replied, We live in a cloud all our lives. Bodden grunted, That's Durhang talking. Hebrick said, Never knew you were so droll. Bodden fell silent and Felicin grinned to herself. He would say little for the rest of the night, since he didn't take well being mocked. She thought, I must remember that, for when he next needs cutting down. Hebrick said, My apologies, Bodden. I was irritated by what Felicin said and took it out on you. More, I appreciated the joke, no matter that it was unintended. Felicin sighed, Give it up. A mule comes out of a sulk eventually, but it's nothing you can force. Hebrick said, So while the swellings left your tongue, its poison remains. She flinched and thought, if you only knew the full truth of that. That's a pretty sick burn by Hebrick right there. Yes, it is. And I'm glad he said it. This part kind of gets to me mostly from Felesson's constant inner dialogue about revenge and moaning about how bad life is. It is bad for her. I'm not saying I'm not trying to say it's not, but it's like, oh, it does get tiresome. You will pay for this constantly. It's just that's all she says. It's like, oh, my good mm-hmm. gracious. It's like. You know, beat a different drum, beat a different dead horse. But it's like, <laughs> I and I, she's earned. It. I'm not saying she has not indeed earned her rights to bitterness, but it's like her inability to see these people as possibly people to team up with and help survive together. She sees not this at all. It's like she's like what, and she irritates me in that aspect. It is tiresome from an outsider's perspective. Yes, that's what it is. I do understand that she is emotionally scarred at this point she's lashing out in anger even though she doesn't appreciate the fact that these two men are actually the reason she's still alive no and they're trying to take care of her even though she's treating them so badly so you tack on just a teenager they can act pretty nasty even without the emotional scarring right and then you add that layer on top of it that bitterness and that anger at the world and i can see from her perspective why she's acting this way but as a reader i'm with you yeah that's that's what it's it always is. been just tiresome with her just being so nasty and yeah. these two yeah you feel bad for them yeah, they've done nothing to earn it yeah she's thinking oh they're gonna slit my throat they're gonna steal my food and blah blah, blah. it's like look if they wanted to do that, they would have done that a long time ago. You wouldn't even be here right now. That kind of reminds me. You said y'all were watching One Piece, right? Yeah. Remember that episode where the boys on the 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 guy that's the chef? Oh yeah. The story, his story. Where he, they're on, they're on the island, and he sits there and starts building that up until he finds out about what that guy did. For the people that haven't watched One Piece, let's tell the story. So, okay, this pirate and this kid—they're the sole survivors of a shipwreck. And they're on top of this rock in the middle of the ocean. The pirate gives the kid a bag of food and tells him to go on the other side of the rock and look for ships passing by. Days and days are going by and the kid eats all the food. After it's like 70 something days, he works himself up and he's like, he had this huge bag. He kept most of the food for himself. All this other stuff. He goes back over there. He starts yelling at the pirate. He goes to the bag, slashes it open. There's no food in it. It's full of treasure. And he's like, what have you been eating? And he sees the pirate cut his own leg off and ate his leg. He gave all the food to the kid. I mean, Uh it really breaks your heart. You know, it does. It does. It's a great great episode, dude. It's like, so it's so amazing. I mean, yeah, it's great. That's why I bring it up because it's very appropriate. Because to this point, you've known these characters at a later stage in their life and the kid who's now grown up is sassing this guy all the time fighting back you know just they work in a restaurant together that the the older guy owns and he's just being nasty to him you know it's exactly like this scenario we're talking about where it's just someone that's really upset and they're taking it on someone that is trying to take care of them yeah and by the way watch that show it's fantastic (laughs) oh yeah of all the live action adaptations i've seen this is the first one that i've been extremely happy with there's no casting changes they've cast every character perfectly yes there's no deviation from the story from the perspective to get some type of viewpoint one way or the other right you know they don't inject any of our current politics into it it's true to the story 
and they cast yes. the characters perfectly. So it's exactly what fans of anything would want from an adaptation. <laughs> You know, yeah. honor the source material. Don't put any other nonsense in it. Give me the stories that I want to see. You know? Yeah. Let me, let me tell you how good this show is, Comron. I started watching it again. I showed it to my dad on a, one of my days off with, with KP. We watched it with him. He loved it because he loves this is an 80 year old man. to begin with. This is an 82-year-old man. Yeah, <laughs> I showed him this show and he was laughing and was like, this was great. I, I didn't ask him if he finished watching the show, but he loved that. That was a great memory. Sitting there watching that first episode with him and him laughing and enjoying it with me and KP. It was great, dude. Yeah, it's really well done. That's how good it is. It's clean and what that's the thing. It's I'm, I, I get tired of things not being clean sometimes. It's, so, it's such a clean and uplifting show and Luffy's so funny. Good graces, he's hysterical. Yeah, I mean, he's really an inspirational character. He's very he inspirational. No. He finds the best in everybody. Yes, he lifts his friends up and he lives to help his friends. And he's loyal. Boy. He does not give up on his friends. No, he does not. It's charming. It's quite charming. <laughs> yeah, these are the attributes that you want to yes. look for in a hero. You know, like <laughs> this is exactly what you're looking for. That's exactly right. It's he's great. It's fantastic. Yeah. Zoro, <laughs> my favorite character. I love that dude. I love them in the anime. He's just so awesome. You guys, if start, you haven't I'm watched it, watching. highly recommend it. I'm going to try the anime. I liked it that much. So the anime, I will warn you, it's like Dragon Ball, sure. where a fight lasts four episodes longer than it needs to. With right. A lot of heavy breathing. Right. You know? <laughs> it's okay. I've seen some of it, but I actually bought the game for the PlayStation 5. There is a game. It's a, it's a turn-based. Okay. It's, it, it's beautiful. I mean, it's fantastic. But it's Japanese, so it's all there's no English dialogue whatsoever. So you have to read everything, and I miss some funny dialogue because I'm like, oh, they're still talking. <laughs> so, mm. No, bring it back to yes, Malazan. One thing that I thought about when I was reading this chapter, I realized we don't get internal monologue from very many people. No, but we're getting it from Duiker. We're getting it from Felicin. Yeah. We never get it from Bodden. We never get it from Heberick. No. Can you think of an instance where we got it from Heberick? No, not at all. Out of that bunch, it's always Felicin. It's She's the only one with the inner dialogue out of those bunch that I think of. Mm -hmm. I had not thought about that before, Conrad. That's well spotted, sir. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Like the dynamics that it brings into the story. Yeah. Because it would be really good to know what Bodden's thinking. Yeah. Because I like, I like Bodden. That enigma it brings that interesting dynamic into it because you're just seeing everything from this bitter person's point of view. Yeah. Yeah, you are well spotted, sir. Thank you. Yeah, that is extremely interesting. Thank you, sir. My pleasure, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's the All job right. description. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. They had seen no one since crossing sinker Lake, the night of the Dosai mutiny. For Felicin, it made the drama of that night now seem somehow pathetic. For all their self-importance, they were but grains of sand in a storm vaster than anything they could comprehend. The thought pleased her. There was still cause for worry. If the uprising had spread to the mainland, they might arrive at the coast only to die waiting for a boat that would never come. They reached a low serrated ridge of rock outcroppings. Beyond it stretched a wave-like expanse of sand. Something rose from the dunes 50 or so paces ahead. It was blunted, crooked. A vague wind rustled on the sands. Gusts of sand caressed their shins as they strode on. The bent pillar, or whatever it was, was proving farther away than Felicin had first thought. As a new sense of scale formed in her mind, her breath hissed between her teeth. Hebrick whispered, I. Not 50 paces away, more like 500. The wind-blurred surface had deceived them. The basin was not a flat sweep of land, but a vast, gradual descent. Rising again around the object, a wave of dizziness followed the realization. The moon had risen above the southern horizon by the time they reached the monolith. Bodden and Hebrick dropped their packs. Bodden sat down and leaned against his, already dismissive of the silent edifice towering over them. Hebrick removed the lantern and the firebox from his pack. As Hebrick worked to light the lantern, Felicin made no effort to help. She watched with fascination as he managed the task with a deafness belying the apparent awkwardness of the scarred stumps of his wrists. Slinging one forearm underneath the lantern's handle, Hebrick rose and approached the dark monolith. Fifty men, hands linked, could not encircle the base. 
the bend occurred seven or eight man lengths up, about three-fifths of the total length. The stone looked both creased and polished, dark gray under the colorless light of the moon. So that's roughly 300 feet in circumference and 80 feet tall. Mm, and I'm always struck by the size of this thing. I think you have big core memories tied to these things too, don't you? Oh, of course. Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how anybody couldn't. Right. In these books. The glow of the lantern revealed the stone to be green. Felicin watched his head tilt back as he scanned upward. Then he stepped forward and pressed a stump against the surface. A moment later, he stepped back. Water sloshed beside her as Bodden drank from a water skin. She reached out and, after a moment, he passed it to her. Sand whispered as Hebrick returned. He squatted. Felicin offered him the bladder. He shook his head, his toad-like face twisted into a troubled frown. Felicin asked, Is this the biggest pillar you've seen, Hebrick? There's a column in Aaron, or so I've heard, that's as high as twenty men, and carved in a spiral from top to bottom. Beneth described it to me once. Bodden grumbled, seen it. Not as wide, but maybe higher. What's this one made of, priest? Hebrick said, jade. Bodden grunted phlegmatically, but Felicin saw his eyes widen slightly. He said, well, I've seen taller. I've seen wider. Hebrick snapped, shut up, Bodden, and wrapped his arms around himself. He glared up at him from under the ridge of his brows. He rasped, that's not a column over there. It's a finger, mm. a finger where one digit has a circumference of 300 feet yeah. for comparison. The circumference of the 50th percentile, 18 year old male index finger is 2.2 inches. Mm. The scale is astronomical. Yeah. And I can't find sizes on this. I, I, I'm not smart enough to do the math on that one. I was trying to ask and trying to look any way I could think on that. And I was like, man, I can't figure out the full size of this fella. So you want to try and extrapolate how big a full body would be here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll have to get back to you on that. Yeah, please. Cause that's cause I'll have to get into like index finger length and you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. Right. There will have to be some assumptions made. <laughs> right. Well, I, say, I, I assume so, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as dawn approached <laughs> i was just gonna say some men are longer than others you know braveheart <laughs> yeah, the quote yes i need to see it's been a long time since i've seen braveheart good gracious i need to see that i like the first half the yes. second half i don't watch unless i'm willing to be very emotional that yes. day <laughs> it's too much for me it is i like seeing yeah. him succeed that's the best part yeah, it's just like good fellas, like the yeah. first half. Don't yes. like to see the downfall. Yes. Yeah. Though I will say, they're yeah, guessing a lot tonight. Yeah, it's <laughs> There were two movies on Netflix. I think one was called The King, and one might have been called The Rebel King. So I think it was The King had Timothy Chalamet in it, and it was based on some Shakespearean play. Awesome movie. Okay. Really, really good. You need to watch it. Okay. The other one had Chris Pine in it, and he played Robert the Bruce. Really? So imagine Robert the Bruce following Braveheart. Yeah. Because they're talking about William Wallace in this movie. He got quartered. They show part of his body in the movie. But definitely watch. I think it's called The Rebel King. That's the okay. Robert the Bruce movie. And then The King. Both of them, super good. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, man. As Don approached, the details of that carved jade finger were revealed. Swells and folds of skin, the whorls of the pad, all became visible. So too did a ridge in the sand directly beneath it. Another finger. Fingers to hand, hand to arm, arm to body. For all the logic of that progression, it was impossible, Felicin thought. No such thing could be fashioned. No such thing could stand or stay in one piece. A hand, but no arm, no body. Hebrick said nothing. He held the wrist that had touched the edifice tucked under him, as if the memory of that contact brought pain. Staring at him in the growing light, Felicin was struck anew by his tattoos. They seemed to have deepened somehow, become sharper. Bodden finally rose and began pitching the two small tents, close to the base of the finger, where the shadows would hold longest. He ignored the towering monolith as he worked. An orange tint suffused the air as the sun climbed higher. Felicin had seen that color of sky before on the island, but it had never been so saturated. She could almost taste it, bitter as iron. Spice. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no. It's okay. 
I like to transport myself to Arrakis in my yes. mind periodically. Oh, it was delayed part two, but it's not too delayed. It's only March. It's next. It's just March. Oh, okay. It's That's not, not too bad. No, 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 no. It's not. It's not a terrible. It's like March twenty fourth. Yeah. So it's not a terrible wait. I'm willing to wait, dude. I'm excited. Oh yeah, they did a good job with that first one. Yeah, they did. As Bodden began on the second tent, Hebrick finally roused himself, his head lifting as he sniffed the air. He growled, Hood's breath. Hasn't there been enough? Phyllison demanded, What is it? What's wrong? Hebrick said, There's been a storm. That's Odotaral dust. Imagine being a mage in an Odotaral storm. Mm. It's bad news right there. That is really bad news. At the tents, Bodden paused. He ran a hand across one shoulder, then frowned at his palm. He said, It's settling. Hebrick said, we'd best get undercover. Phyllison snorted, as if that will do any good. We've mined the stuff in case you've forgotten. Whatever effect it's had on us, it's happened long ago. Now, does she have a good point or is she simply being an argumentative teenager here? I think I think it's not necessarily a good point because of what, what her Borg says. So, so I, therefore, I believe that she's strictly being an argumentative little brat here. <laughs> I think she's just going to be contradictory to everything that's going on here because she's having a hard time. So, I mean, you don't think like working 16 hours in a mine and being covered in it the entire time is going to affect you. And then you go take a shower at the end of the day for like whatever, five, six well, hours you get to sleep. That's true. But I'm not sure. I guess she's probably true to the, I, I now thought about this because we got a flashback to gardens where relic relic puts the relic uh, he rubs it on the on his skin so that'd be yeah. the same thing so it it might have done something you know that's probably i think this really makes it make more sense because they're just coated in that stuff from from head to toe like the like the perimeter coat coated in spice all the time <laughs> yeah so yeah they're breathing it yeah. they're covered in it yeah it's all yeah because originally i was like man she's just being nasty yeah. and then i was like wait a second she actually like, has a point i, I do think she actually has a point here yeah I agree. It's probably not good to be breathing it, but at the same time, whatever damage had been done has been done. Yeah. Well, they ought to be pretty immune to magic, you'd think. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I, I mean to some extent, yeah. I mean, like they may, may, I'm curious if because of being saturated in that, if they would have like an area effect, like of deadening magic, possibly. Like not a big mm -hmm. area effect, but it's like a, well, it's just like relics, you know, personal area of effect from auditorial on him. Like the Salamiri force like, bubbles, right? <laughs> from the Timothy Zahn series oh, for Star Wars. Only got two more weeks before Ahsoka's over, and I'm excited to start that show when it's over. I haven't read anything about it, so I don't know if it's supposed to be good or not. Yeah, I haven't but, either. I don't. I don't want to know. I just want to yeah. get into it. Got too it. much catching up to do at this point to <laughs> even think you, about that yet. Yes, yeah. you do. All right. Hebrick said, back at Skull Cup, we could wash ourselves at day's end and slung an arm through the food pack's strap and dragged it toward the tents. Phyllison saw that he still held his other stump, the one that had touched the edifice tight against his midriff. She asked, and you think that made a difference? If that's true, why did every mage who worked there die or go mad? You're not thinking clearly, Hebrick. Hebrick snapped, sit there then, and ducked under the first tense flap, then pulled the pack in after him. Phyllisin glanced at Bodden, who shrugged, then resumed readying the second tent, without evident haste. She sighed. She was exhausted, yet not sleepy. If she took to the tent, she would simply lie there with her eyes open and studying the weave of the canvas above her face. Bodden said, best get inside. She said, I'm not sleepy. He stepped close, the motion fluid like a cat's. He said, I don't give a damn if you're sleepy or not. Sitting out under the sun will dry you out meaning you'll drink more water, meaning less for us, meaning get in this damn tent last before I lay a hand to your backside. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Thank you. That is actually a great point and a good reason to be inside. Mm -hmm. You know, as a, the other one, kind of weak. I agree with her on that, but Bodden brings up a great point here. He does bring up a good point. Water's limited. Phyllisson said, if Beneth was here, you wouldn't, Bonin snarled. The bastard's dead, and Hood take his rotten soul to the deepest pit. She sneered, brave now, you wouldn't have dared stand up against him. He studied her as he would a blood fly caught in a web. He said, maybe I did, and gave her a sly <laughs> grin before he turned away. Suddenly cold, Phyllisson watched him go to the other tent, crouch down and crawl inside. She thought, I'm not fooled, Bodden. You were a mongrel skulking in alleys, and all that's changed is that you've left the alleys behind. You would squirm in the sand at Beneth's feet if he were here. 
She waited another minute in defiance before entering her own tent. She has a blind spot here. I definitely think Bodden was the more dangerous of the two. What do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, because we never really saw Beneth do anything of note. We can assume that he's a pretty bad dude to rise to the top. It's kind of like Master Blaster in Mad Max. Not Mad Is it Master <laughs> Blaster? It's like, I'm assuming that you're the... Who you done Barter <laughs> Town? <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> not tina turner no, billy you know the answer i'm sorry i'm sorry i, I was i meant what i don't know what the other i mean i'm thinking of i'm thinking of the best mad max the first the second one um mad max i don't mean i don't mean the third one I'm oh sorry. Who, just the, walk just away just walk away just, just walk <laughs> away that, that guy that's who i'm thinking about that's how i see beneth beneth is that guy I think that's a pretty bad dude. Okay. I think he's a bad guy. I got a South Park reference here. Okay. <laughs> I know exactly when what Butters you're going, was doing yes. that. Oh, my voice. Word. Yeah. There was that episode. I died oh my when word. I saw that. I said, I love it because oh, the, the guy's actually looking like, he's pretty good at that. It's like, you know, because it's. Yeah. Just, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> that was the. The one where the girls were turned oh. against the boys and they made an encampment that was just like in Mad Max, right? Where yes. they, they had yes. like the gas and everything and the boys yes. come up to the camp. Yeah. Oh my god. Just walk away. That was perfect. <laughs> just walk away. Too good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Ooh. So did you ever see Fury Road? I have not. I tried to watch it, kind of lost interest. It was just so over the top at the beginning. I'm like, I, I, I just don't know if I'm going to be able to handle this. It starts off with a bang. That entire first 20 minutes practically is just one massive adrenaline rush. It is. I was kind of like, huh, it's a little too much. I was like, this is just a little too much, you know. Oh, I it. liked it a lot. Well, that's good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I know it's got a lot. Well, it's got Tom Hardy. I wanted to like it because I love Tom Hardy. Yeah, Charlize Theron too. Yeah, I love hers as well. She's, She's good fantastic. Enough. I need to give it a shot. I'll, I'll try and give it another shot. All right. Yeah. But to your point about Bodden being better, we're in agreement there because we never really saw Beneth do anything no. remotely close to escaping from a town, <laughs> lighting things on fire, burning three buildings <laughs> to the ground as a diversion, <laughs> killing however many guards, not being able to be found. Uh, Beneth had none of that yeah. on his sneaks resume. Sneaks back in. Yeah. Sneaks back in, gets them, and they, and, and during the chaos and they leave. It's like, yeah, Beneth, yeah, <laughs> please. <laughs> The only thing he's got is they share the first the initial, the first name, first letter of their name. That's about it. Yeah. <laughs> Felicin laid down on her bedroll. The eagerness to sleep prevented her from doing so. She wished she had some durhang or a jug of wine. The crimson river of her dreams had become an embrace, protective and welcoming. She conjured from memory an echo of the image and all the feelings that went with it. The river flowed with purpose, ordered and inexorable. When in its warm currents, she felt close to understanding that purpose. She knew she would discover it soon, and with that knowledge, her world would change, become so much more than it was now. Not just a girl, plump and out of shape and used up. The vision of her future reduced to days when it should be measured in decades. A girl who could call herself young only with sneering irony. So she thinks that when she understands this dream... It is going to lead her to be something more than she than what she views herself as today. Is that how you read that? Yes, I do. I think she she looks like she's heading toward her purpose, or at least she maybe she thinks the dream is leading her toward her purpose. And I wish her the best of mm. luck in this. <laughs> <laughs> For all that dream promised her, there was a value in self contempt, a counterpoint between her waking and sleeping hours, what was and what could be. A tension between what was real and what was imagined, or so Hebrick would put it from his acid-pocked critical eye. The scholar of human nature held it in low opinion. He would deride her notions of destiny, and her belief that the dream offered something palpable would give him cause to voice his contempt, not that he's needed cause. I'm not sure self-contempt is ever a path to a productive future. No, it usually just leads to despair. So, yeah, not very productive. <laughs> Felicin thought, I hate myself, but he hates everyone else. Which of us has lost the most? 
And what do you think about that? Which of them has lost more? Because to me, that's a tough question. It is a tough question. I think from a, a lot of standpoints, I, I don't really hesitate to say I think the Falesin has lost almost the most because she is a kid and having to go through this stuff that an adult shouldn't have to go through, let alone a child have to go through it. I think she's lost a lot more because she's given up so much of her body and uh, you know she willingly gave up her body to try and make things easier for herself. I think that's the thing that she needs to have some realization. She thought she was doing this for other people. It's like, no, you really just served yourself. That's all you did while well, you're at Skullcap. And now do I blame her? I don't blame her. But again, it's like, I don't know people do what they got to do to survive. I'm not here to front people out on what they do to survive. <laughs> okay. I'll push back a little bit on initially on the boat she did it to get them out from the water right. you know people were dying in that water i mean she definitely got herself out of it i don't know if at that point she was thinking about herself only yeah but the question here is not so much has she lost her innocence it's more specifically if someone hates themselves but has the capacity to love other people or if someone loves themselves but hates everyone else, which one has lost more? Because that's a really tough determination. Because the way I look at it is, if you're if you love yourself, which you should, you know, you, you should be happy with yourself. And if you're yeah. not, then you know, work on your internal dialogue to the point where you can at least accept yourself. Yes. But if you hate everybody else, uh, you know. I, and that's what I, I don't, but I don't see that he really hates. Is she talking about Bowden, Bowden, or is she talking about? She's talking about Haboric, isn't she? It's like a contrast, right? Yes. Which of us has lost the most? She hates herself. He hates everybody else. So presumably, the roles are flipped. They are where she <clears throat> loves other people potentially, and he loves himself. I, I, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. I, for, I thought I had my logic worked out pretty good, but and, and for her, thinking that she had lost the most because she is this kid, but you're, but you're right. If you're going to shut everyone else out, you may lose more by, love, by hating everyone else and loving yourself. Yeah. Yeah. But then it's like, okay, yeah. So you don't want to be lonely. No. That's what I think of. But <laughs> what's the point of being alive if you, yeah, you love yourself, but you don't have anybody else? Yeah. I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a conundrum. It I, I don't really think there's a clean answer here no <laughs> no know? it's not it's just yeah that's just all i got though <laughs> that's my cleanest answer so <laughs> i don't know if i could pick yeah it's hard it's bad both are bad both are bad situations yeah i think that's the main takeaway is you want to at least be accepting of yourself and have other people yeah and not hold other people in contempt felicin awoke with her mouth parched and tasting of rust she heard sounds of packing outside a short murmur from hebrick Bodden's answering grunt she closed her eyes, trying to recapture the steady flowing river that had carried her through her sleep, but it was gone. She sat up and winced as every joint protested. The others experienced the same. Heberick guessed it was a nutritional deficiency, though he did not know what it might be. They had dried fruit, strips of smoked mule, and some kind of doci bread. She crawled from the tent into the chill morning air. The two men sat eating. There was little left of their rations, with the exception of the bread, which was salty and tended to make them desperately thirsty. Hebrick had tried to insist that they eat the bread first over the first few days while they were still strong, but neither she nor Bodden had listened, and for some reason he abandoned the idea with the next meal. Felicin recalled she had mocked him for that, unwilling to follow your own advice, eh, old man? What a nasty little thing she can be. <laughs> oh, yeah. She really is a nasty little thing. <laughs> yeah, just picking fights over this. The bread, even. Yet now she thought the advice had been good. They would reach the salt-laden coast with naught but even saltier bread to eat and little water for their thirst. Felicin admitted to herself that she had mocked and ignored the advice out of spite, nothing more. As for Baden, well, rare was the criminal with brains, and he wasn't at all rare. She joined the breakfast, ignoring their looks as she took an extra mouthful of lukewarm water from the bladder when washing down the smoked meat. Not good. That's a bad in a situation like this when you're taking away from the other people. Yes, it's a bad situation made worse by this brat. And I don't know why Bob doesn't exert more leadership or force her to stop taking more for herself when she needs less than these adult men do. 
When she was done, Bodden repacked the food. Hebrick sighed, what a threesome we are. Felicin raised a brow and said, you mean our dislike of each other? You shouldn't be surprised, old man. In case you haven't noticed, we're all broken in some way, aren't we? The gods know you've pointed out my fall from grace often enough, and Bodden's nothing more than a murderer. He's dispensed with all notions of brotherhood and is a bully besides, meaning he's a coward at heart. She glanced over to see him crouched at the packs, flatly eyeing her. Felicin gave him a sweet smile. Right, Bodden? The man said nothing, the hint of a frown in his expression as he studied her. Felicin returned her attention to Hebrick. She said, your flaws are obvious enough, hardly worth mentioning. Hebrick muttered, save your breath, lass. I don't need no 15-year-old girl telling me my failings. She asked, why did you leave the priesthood, Hebrick? Skim the coffers, I suppose. So they cut your hands off, then tossed you onto the rubbish heap behind the temple. That's certainly enough to make anyone take up writing history as a profession. Bodden said, time to go. Felicin said, but he hasn't answered my question. Bodden said, I'd say he has, girl. Now shut up. Today you carry the other pack, not the old man. Felicin said, a reasonable suggestion, but no thanks. Face darkening, Bodden rose. Hebrick said, leave it be, and moved to sling the straps through his arms. In the gloom, Felicent saw the stump that had touched the jade finger for the first time. It was swollen and red, the puckered skin stretched. Tattoos crowded the end of the wrist, turning it nearly solid dark. She realized then that the etchings had deepened everywhere on him, grown riotous like vines. She asked, what's happened to you? He glanced over and said, I wish I knew. She noted, you burned your wrist on that statue. Hebrick said, not burned. Hurts like Hood's own kiss, though. Can magic thrive buried in Odotaro sand? Can Odotaro give birth to magic? I've no answers, lass, for any of this. Phyllison muttered, well, it was a stupid thing to do, touching that damn thing. Serves you right. It's these continual nitpicks and barbs that really make it hard, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Bodden started off without comment. Felicin fell in behind him. She asked, Is there a water hole ahead this night? Bodden grunted, Should have asked that before you took more than your ration. She said, Well, I didn't. So is there? Bodden responded, We lost half a night yesterday. She asked, Meaning? Bodden said, Meaning no water until tomorrow night. He looked back at her as he walked and said, You'll wish you'd save that mouthful. She made no reply. She had no intention of being honorable when the time came for her next drink. She thought, honors for fools, honors a fatal flaw. I'm not going to die on a point of honor, Bodden. Hebrick's probably dying anyway. It'd be wasted on him. Hebrick trudged in her wake. The sound of his footfalls dimmed as he fell further back. Phyllisin concluded it would be she and Bodden in the end, just the two of them, standing facing the sea at the western edge of the island. She thought, the weak always fall to the wayside. It was the first law of Skull Cup. Indeed, it was the first lesson she'd learned in the streets of Unta on the march to the slave ships. Back then, in her naivete, she'd looked upon Bodden's murder of Lady Gason as an act of reprehensible horror. If he were to do the same today, putting Hebrick out of his misery, she would not even blink. She thought, a long journey, this one. Where will it end? Then she thought of the River of Blood, and the thought warmed her. True to Bodden's prediction, there was no water hole that night. He selected as a campsite a sandy bed surrounded by wind-sculpted projections of limestone. Bleached human bones littered the bed. Felicin sat down with her back to a rock and watched for Hebrick's eventual appearance. He had never lagged behind this distance before. She began to wonder if his lifeless body wasn't lying out there somewhere. Bodden crouched beside her and said, I told you to carry the food pack. Phyllisin thought, not out of sympathy for the old man then. I don't think Bodden wanted her to carry it so much for his benefit. He was doing it for Hebrick. Do you agree yeah. with that or am I projecting? I think I, th I assumed it was for Hebrick because those two have been part of this plan. And I think he's trying to help Hebrick. They're in it together. Yeah, that's how I think of it. Phyllisin said, you'll just have to go find it, won't you? Bodden straightened and stared eastward for a long moment. She watched him set off, softly gasping as he loped into a steady jog once clear of the rocks. For the first time, she became truly frightened of Bodden. She thought, 
He's been hoarding food. He has a hidden skin of water. There's no other way he could still have such reserves. And that's pretty impressive. What a beast of a man he is. Yes. That theoretical fight between Kalam and Baden would be something to behold, wouldn't Ooh, it? Yes, it would. And I think because I think both these fellows, I, I, we know Kalam's a pretty big fella. That's the, that belies mm-hmm. his grace. I feel the same way about Baden. I kind of feel that he's a pretty big fellow too, and it would be a long, ugly fight between those two. Agreed. I don't know who would win. I don't either. They might kill each other. <laughs> <clears throat> It'd be nasty. It would be. Phyllis and scrambled to her feet and rushed over to the other pack. The tents had been raised, the bedrolls set out within them. The pack sat in a deflated heap close by. Left in it was a wrapped pouch that she recognized as containing their first aid supplies, a battered flint and tinder box that she'd not seen before, Bodden's own, and beneath a flap sewn along one edge of the bottom of the pack, a small flat packet of deer hide. No skin of water, no hidden pockets of food. Unaccountably, her fear of the man deepened. And no kidding, with her suspicions proved unfounded, the only explanation left is he is an absolute monster of a man when it comes to stamina and resilience. Yeah, agreed. (laughs) Phyllisson sat down in the soft sand beside the pack. After a moment, she reached to the hide packet, loosened its drawstrings, and unfolded it to reveal a set of fine thieves' tools, an assortment of picks, minute saws and files, knobs of wax, a small sack of finely ground flour, and two dismantled stilettos the needle-like blades deeply blued and exuding a bitter caustic smell, the bone halves polished and dark-stained, the small hilts and pieces that hinge together to form an X-shaped guard and hold with weighted pommels of iron wrapped around lead cores, throwing weapons, and assassin's weapons. The last item in the packet was tucked into a leather loop, the talon of some large cat, amber-colored and smooth. I have a couple of things here. First, this talon is an incredibly important detail. It's really important to remember that Baden has this. Yes. Second, I wonder how he got this stuff into Skull Cup. Did he manage to sneak it in person? Well, I would think someone, well, they had a contact inside Skull Cup. Was it Pella? Yes. I would think someone like Pella was who had that there for him. Okay. Phyllison wondered if the talon held poison painted invisibly on its surface. The item was ominous in its mystery. She rewrapped the packet, returning it and everything else to the pack. She heard heavy footsteps approach from the east and straightened. Bodden appeared from between the limestone projections, the pack on his shoulders and Hebrick in his arms. Bodden was not even out of breath. Mm. That's crazy, carrying the pack and a full-sized man in his yeah. arms. And not, and not even out of breath. Total beast. <laughs> yeah. Bodden said he needs water as he strode into the camp and laid an unconscious Hebrick down on the soft sand. He said, in this pack, last quickly. Phyllisson did not move. She said, why? We need it more, Bodden. Bodden paused for a heartbeat, then slipped his arms free of the pack and dragged it around. He asked, would you want him saying the same if you were the one lying here? Soon as we get off this island, we can go our separate ways. But for now, we need each other, girl. Phyllisson said, he's dying. Admit it. Bodden said, we're all dying, and unstoppered the bladder, then eased it between Hebrick's cracked lips. He said, drink, old man. Swallow it down. Phyllisson said, those are your rations you're giving him, not mine. Bodden gave her a cold grin and said, well, no one would think you anything but nobleborn. Mind you, opening your legs for anyone and everyone back in Skull Cup was proof enough, I suppose. She said, it kept us all alive, you bastard. Bodden said, kept you plump and lazy, you mean. Most of what me and Hebrick ate came from the favors I did for the Dosai guards. Beneth gave us dregs to keep you sweet. He knew we wouldn't tell you about it. He used to laugh at your noble cause. She said, you're lying. Still grinning, he said, as you say. Hebrick coughed and his eyes opened. He blinked in the dawn's light. Bodden said, you should see yourself. From five feet away, you're one solid tattoo, as dark as a Dalhanese warlock. Up this close, and I can see every line, every hair of the boar's fur. It's covered your stump, too. Not the one that's swollen, but the other one. Here, drink some more. Man, I can't wait to meet some of these Dalhanese warlocks. (laughs) Puss is Dalhan, isn't he? He is. But he's he's a high priest. Is that a a difference without distinction? 
a high priest and warlocks? I think warlocks would be closer to what we see Sormo Enath doing. Okay. Or we haven't met them yet, but the Bargast shaman. Okay. You know, okay. closer yes. to that kind of stuff. Yes. Okay. That makes a more sense, more, yeah. more, more tribal or just more, but, but is, but the other thing is a high priest equivalent to a high mage. You can be one or the other or both. Yes. That's what I'm thinking. It's okay. Cause, cause what was it? Is it Baruch? Who's the high priest or was it Mammoth? That was the high priest of drag is Mammoth. Mammoth. Mammoth was the high priest of drag. Yes. Okay. I was just kind of curious. <laughs> Phyllis and snapped bastard as she watched the last of their water trickle into Hebrick's mouth. She thought he left Beneth to die. Now he's trying to poison the memory of him too. It won't work. I did what I did to keep them both alive. And they hate that fact, both of them. It eats them inside, the guilt for the price I paid. And that's what Bodden's now trying to deny. He's cutting his conscience loose. So when he slips one of those knives into me, he won't feel a thing. Just another dead nobleborn, another Lady Gason. She is so deluded that she thinks Bodden is going to kill her. If he was planning on doing it, they could have just left her to sink in Sinker Lake. That's right. And maybe this is paranoia from her forced sobriety. Yeah, I was wondering about that as well. That's a good thing that you mentioned that. The withdrawal symptoms yes. of no Durhang. Yes, because that, that, that could also account for her being such a nasty little witch, too. So, good point. I mean, not all of it. She already, she already had a lot of that in her, though. Not at first. I said that she was an innocent girl at first, but yeah, it's, it's but I, yeah, I'm just, I think a lot of that could be some drug withdrawal and going through sobriety. Agreed. Phyllis and spoke loudly and met Hebrick's eyes. I dream a river of blood every night. I write it, and you're both there at first, but only at first, because you both drown in that river. Believe anything you like. I'm the one who's going to live through this. Me just me she left the two men to stare at her back as she walked to her tent we are going to stop there this week we'll pick up the chapter next week good episode for standout moments i enjoyed finding out just how vast the refugee train from hisar is it's such a large scale i know it's it's quite shocking and i'm still wowed by this fact and that colton has led refugees by what did we say about forty thousand, roughly and that's just Something the refugees. Like that. on, it's on the run. Just so amazing. So cool. So yeah, dangerous. On foot. No water. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. When Hebert called out Felicin and her poisonous tongue, that was mm. pretty good. That's nice. Memorable one. I wish these would stick in our minds. Maybe that would chill her out a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> the mind-boggling scale of that jade finger. We'll yes. have to come back on the size of the total giant after I do some maths. Yeah, after you maths that out for us, I'm really curious what that's like. <laughs> yeah. For some reason, I thought in my flashback in my brain, I was thinking it was, I can't remember if it was just the soul finger, if it was something else, but I knew it was a little big chunk. I'm like, oh, that's right. There's so much buried beneath, but it, but it was just the finger. It's like, good gracious, that's enormous. And it's, again, core memory, core memory. It is. Phyllis and dreaming of a river of blood, that's quite ominous. Yes. If you're dreaming of River of Blood, I mean, isn't that foreshadowing? <laughs> I guess so. Witnessing Bodden's frightening resilience and the strange talon that he had hidden in his little kit mm. was also really interesting. Yeah. And I really like Bowden. And I, I really wanted to just slap her. Not hurt her, but give her one of those, you know. Little pow pow? Yeah, the little pow pow. You know, you've seen, you've seen <laughs> Airplane. Have you seen Airplane? Been a long a time ago. I don't remember the specifics. Well, there, just don't call me Shirley. That's about all I... <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one but it's there's a scene where there's a passenger freaking out and you know it was always traditional in those 70s movies to just turn around and give you know, someone some man turns around and gives her a slap to calm her down and she starts to calm down but then the camera pans up and you see like 30 passengers lined up and they start slapping her as they all line up calm down oh. calm down calm. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> i just want someone to i just wanted to give her one of those just to kind of wake her up make her cry a little bit and go oh okay maybe uh <laughs> Maybe this will, uh, maybe I need to chill out a little bit. <laughs> I got to be honest with you. I don't think it'd make a difference with her. Nah. She's so twisted on the inside. She you is. know, she is. I, I don't, I don't think it'd make a difference. I she think just, she's, she's now mistaken pain and pleasure a lot. She's gotten weird. People, when they go through stuff like that, they get really messed up. Yeah, they do. They, they really do. Some interesting stuff that we've covered so far this yeah. chapter. Some of it. It's kind of painful. I don't know how enjoyable it was. There's some <laughs> difficult just stuff going on. She's you know, always the difficult. way that they're interacting with each other. Yes. 
she's always difficult, but it starts to get, you know, I'm ready to get through the rest of it because uh, next week's going to be great. I mean, this is a good, oh, this, yeah. despite this, it's still a great chapter. It's an amazing chapter. It's oh, crazy. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's enjoyable. Yeah. Some really memorable stuff happening. Yes, yes I'm really Key excited. Key plot points <laughs> yeah. this chapter so far. Yeah. yeah. Good job tonight, Billy. Hey, great job, brother. Good, good episode. Thanks. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? No, just great. Th thanks for being with us again, folks. It's such a great joy to go through this stuff with y'all. Yeah, we really appreciate everybody listening and especially our Patreon subscribers. Yes. We really appreciate your support as well. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. See y'all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com. Mm -hmm.